band sounds real good. You know? <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. Keep it up. There will be an extra dollar in for you. How y'all doing this morning? Hey, don't worry, tourist. That sun will come out, won't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to see you today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I'm really happy this morning because there are absolutely no announcements that I need to make this morning. Thank you very much. I'm really happy. But, but notwithstanding, look in your bulletin. There's a lot of things in there that are happening. Y'all look through. Well, now then, let's kick this shindig off. Let's stand up and greet one another and say God loves you this morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> ah, I have to take a breath there. I was waiting on my helpers, so thank you for being patient. We have so much fun stuff going on here at Church by the Sea. And first, I'm going to mention that we have our back to school drive, and all of our backpacks and school supplies are due next Sunday. And our youth are going to be putting them together along with our Sunday school kids. So if you know anyone who has a child that needs a backpack, school supplies, contact the church office, or have them come see me right next door in the education building, and we can get them backpacks that day, August 6th, and then also at the office on Monday. So um, that'll be a great help for any family, so just let me know. We also have a wonderful Back to School Splash event next Saturday. I think our marquee says July 5th. It's August 5th. And uh, so please spread the word to everyone. Invite your friends. Here's a picture of our slide. We had it last year. The kids had such a blast. And they go down on a little inner tube and they just had so much fun with it. And we have water games and lots of just fun stuff for family and kids to do. So this event is for children and their parents to come hang out and uh, so they have to have adult supervision. And after that, we go into our sanctuary and they can bring their dinner and we'll supply popcorn and candy and the movie will begin at six. And I think Susan has a little clip for you. And you may be seated. You guys are good. So for any of you big kids, if you want to come and see the movie, you're welcome to join us too. And again, that's 2 o'clock, the water slide opens, and then the movie begins at 6 p.m. So now we have something for us ladies of the church. We have two, uh, two, two women's Bible study weekends, and we have a short clip about the Beth Moore on September 16th. all figured out by now. I mean, 35 years into studying the scriptures in depth, and I'm still 
still searching for things, still asking lots of questions, still seeing so much mystery, but I've come to the conclusion that that's part of the adventure of it, that God has given us this whole walk that involves so much mystery, that it's part of the majesty that we can never fully figure it out. This is where I'm headed for this year's simulcast. The name of it is Captivated, the wonder of Christ on the winding road. When we can't see around that corner, when we don't know exactly what's going on, when we don't know exactly how God is going to answer it and what life is going to look like in a year, our God is faithful. I would so much love for you to come and join us for this simulcast. I think we have something special ahead. So that is September 16th, and we have two ways you can sign up, and it's $25. That includes lunch and a real light breakfast, just some muffins and coffee and waters throughout. This is being brought to you by the Board of Christian Education. This is open to any women in the community. Please invite your friends. Come join us for the day. It's one day, September 16th. You have a flyer in your bulletin that has the information. And you can register at the church office, or you can come over and visit me in the education building and sign up there. Along with that, we have been invited from the Harvester United Methodist Church. They came and we host, let them have a women's retreat day here not long ago. And we all had so much fun fellowshipping together that they've invited us to join them for their women's retreat in September, the very last weekend of September. That information is also on your insert in your bulletin. This is just a wonderful way to put everything aside. Go have a wonderful time in Anna Maria Island. And so I believe it's 65 for the weekend, and it will be so much fun for us ladies to join them. So if you're interested in this, this is a little bit of a quicker sign up here for this because they just have a lot to plan and make sure they have enough rooms and you know who's coming, et cetera. So if you're interested, call the church office or come over, sign up, we'll give you a call, give you more information, and you can decide if you'd like to join them also. So Board of Christian Education really appreciates all the men and women in our church, and we hope to meet more of your needs to get more of God's word besides just on Sunday. So we'd love to have you join us and hope to see you there. Thank you, Lisa. What are y'all doing sitting down? Let's stand up and let's sing, Trust and Obey.
join your hearts with me as we pray our prayer of invocation. Lord, our God, you choose to teach your children by the light of the Holy Spirit. By the same Spirit, may we recognize your presence among us, reveal to us your truth, visit us with your grace, and fill our hearts with your amazing love till we can contain it no more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. You please be seated. Today our message is going to be centered around the Word of God. So today I thought there's the most appropriate reading of Scripture should come from Psalm 119. I'm going to begin with verse 105, come back and read verses 10 through 16. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. With all my heart I have sought you, O Lord. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways, and I shall delight in your statutes and I shall not forget your word. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is only through your word that we know you intimately and personally. Yes, we understand generally, by nature, by all that you have created, there is a wonderful creator. But you have not left us without a great testimony in that you have provided us with these wonderful scriptures as we begin to read, we begin to learn about who you are. Oh, you're so holy, and you're so wonderful, and you bring all of your greatness, and you say to us that you will be a father to us, as a father teaches the children the precepts and the understanding and the wisdom of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, you've done that through your scriptures. And how wonderful it is to sit with you privately, alone in the shadows, maybe of the morning, of the afternoon or evening. And there we open your word and you give something to us that speaks directly to us so that we can make application of that word. And boy, and it fills our lives, it fills our hearts. And then it's so good, Lord, when we're in the congregation and you teach us Oh, I pray, Father, that the words of my mouth don't come out with something that Dave Ruth thinks ought to be said or his opinion is ever shared, but rather that your truth is revealed and your word is honored in this sanctuary. And Heavenly Father, we have come here this morning with glad hearts, filled with joy, enjoying your wonderful presence, enjoying fellowship with one another, how sweet and good it is. But Father, we also have other issues, issues that you have said to come to you as our father and as, a, as our daddy and, and share our hearts with you. So now, Lord, 
we can't all just take the time right now, but collectively, through your word, through that wonderful, fabulous prayer that our great teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, he taught us to pray this prayer, which will encompass all of our needs, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen and amen. Ushers, would you please come forward as we continue to worship the Lord through our tithes and offerings. Doxology. Yes, Heavenly Father, we do praise you. Lord Jesus Christ, who shows us the Father in human form, Spirit of God, who brings the great wisdom and truth to our heart. Today, we express our love to you in that showing that we have brought gifts today, our tithes and special offerings. We bring them to you to say, we do not trust in material wealth, but we trust only in you. And so therefore, please receive these gifts for your work, for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, dear friends. Now, I don't know if you open your hymnals anymore. Who opens your hymnals? Raise your hand. Let me see you. How many, I mean, still... Still need the notes, don't you? Yeah. 
and the rest of us, we're getting used to looking up here on the screen, and we're going to sing, Jesus is all the world to me. Please be seated. Yes, Jesus is our wonderful friend, as we will learn this morning. Well, I've been in a series now for a long time. We've been leafing through the book of Acts, picking out certain characters so that we can learn from their lives. Boy, they're great, wonderful examples. Today, we're going to talk about women of renown in the early church. And I want to point out Priscilla this morning. But before I get started, the one thing that I have to emphasize this morning, because this is the main part of the lesson. Sure, we're going to learn about Priscilla. She's a wonderful example for us, but notwithstanding, what you've got to grasp this morning is Paul's method for sharing the gospel. Because I want you to also be able to use Paul's method for sharing the gospel, and I will mention this about three different times throughout the lesson. Let's take a look and let's see what Paul's method was for sharing the gospel. The first thing Paul would do, he would always go to the Old Testament scripture, and he would reason with those who were willing to listen. And I think listening has become a lost art. We want to tell our story. We want to talk our part. We want to give our opinion. More important than anything else, it's a willingness to listen to someone. So Paul is reasoning with those who are wonderfully listening, proving by the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah Christ. And so I'm going to give you four points 
And I don't want you to miss them, so if you have to, you write them on the palm of your hand. I do that frequently. I know y'all think I memorize all this stuff, right? And then some of you might want to write it on an offering envelope. I don't care. But think about this, and you'll listen to me, and I'll mention. Here's the very first one. Paul would always take them to the Scripture. Well, Paul only had the Old Testament Scripture, and there's plenty of references to the coming of the Messiah. Perhaps Paul would do something like this. Come now, brethren, let us reason together. Now that word reason, he, it's an old Hebrew word, and it means to rationally, logically make your position so crystal clear in order to persuade somebody to come to a decision. That's the first thing he would do. All right, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to the mattresses. I mean, I'm going to... I'm going to work with you all night long. You remember, yes, that Paul preached a sermon one time, right? And it started getting late into the night, and the young lad fell out of the window. He fell asleep. Paul had to go down there, raise him from the dead. I hope I don't have to raise you from the dead this morning. Come on now. That's one of my humorous tries. Anyway, never mind. Thanks, John. I know I was trying. Here we go. Paul would do something like this. He'd quote the Old Testament. Let's say that he would use, I don't know, something off the top of my head. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. The Lord says, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow, and though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Sons of Abraham, Hebrews, and those among you who fear God, you Gentile Greeks, we preach to you the good news that God has fulfilled this promise in the Old Testament in that he has raised up Jesus from the dead as it is written in the second psalm and then he'd go to the second psalm and he'd start quoting it and then he'd teach him that as it is in the prophet Isaiah and then oh then we go to Jeremiah and let's not leave out Ezekiel well if you don't believe me then let's go back to Moses in Genesis Chapter 3, verse 50, See, he would do that, and he would show them the scriptures and accurately explain them. And everybody, oh, the Messiah, yes. Oh, I see that. All right, very good. The second thing Paul would do is that he would tell stories of Jesus' life. Yes, Christ came as a it was virgin birth, and then he grew up to be a man to the age of approximately, say, around 33 years old. And he would tell him all about his ministry, of uh, bringing salvation, of healing, yes, and all the miracles that he would do. And then he'd say, yes, and Christ came to die on the cross for us to pay for our sins so that we won't have to pay for anything. No, 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 he paid it all in full on the cross. And to prove that God could give us eternal life, he raised Jesus from the dead, and no longer do we have to fear death. And then he went on to talk about Christ's ascension, into heaven. And then the third thing he would do is he would give his testimony. Now, do you have a testimony? I've been wanting to do this for about a thousand years. I'd love to have a couple of microphones up here, and then some of you come up here and just share your testimony. Well, wouldn't that, I mean, okay, I'll do that sometime. Uh, Barbara, you're first, so, you know, you get ready. I know. <laughs> put, put the pressure on you. He'd tell about his testimony. He would, where am I? I better get over there so that I don't get off script. He would tell them about how Jesus Christ saved such a wretched man like Paul, forgiving Paul of all of his sins, the filthy, dirtiest murderer I've ever met. Hated God in the name of God. I know oh, how Christ saved him and made him born again and transformed him into a minister of the gospel. Incredible. It's almost like, okay, I'm being a little foolish here. If God could he, uh, save Paul, he can save anybody, right? Because there was never anybody like Saul of Tarsus until Christ got a hold of him. And then finally, number four, he would invite that person to receive Christ as Savior. Take them to the Scriptures explained to them the life of Jesus Christ and what he did. He gave his personal testimony and then gave them an invitation. And scripture tells us Paul would invite them, all the listeners, to receive Christ. And many believed and others turned away. 
I know. I can't imagine. Yes, even the great Apostle Paul did not save everybody. For God gives us a free will. You know what that free will is? That free will is to reject God. Now then, how would you like, I just think this would be great, how would y'all like to go on a missionary trip with Paul? Come on, you want to do that this morning? Oh, sure you do. And if you don't, don't tell us, okay? Just, all right, let's go on a trip with him. Go home, get your toothbrush, get one change of clothes, maybe get that raincoat. You ready? Let's go with him. All right, Acts chapter 13, verse 48. When the Greeks and the Gentiles heard the gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And many, many, as had been appointed to eternal life, they believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread by many throughout the region. So let me ask you this question. Who was spreading the gospel? One word. Who? The listeners of Paul. Yes. Many. Many. Oftentimes we will think that, yes, it was the missionaries who would go off and they would be the ones that would bring salvation. Yes, I understand that. But it wasn't the, the great missionaries as we think of them. They were all these, I don't know who they are. I just can't wait to mean it, uh, meet them. But I call them the no-named people in, in the scriptures. We don't know who they are. The great ones, mighty ones of God that he does not reveal. It was these ones who were being saved that took the gospel. And it says in the Greek, when it says took the, they went out through all the region, what that is in the Greek, it is they went in all different directions sharing the gospel. They took the gospel to Europe. Now let me ask you, do you understand? Once they heard the gospel, and it so totally changed their lives and the, and the fetters fell off and they were no longer imprisoned by false gods, pagan gods and rules of secular humanistic men. They couldn't contain themselves. They are the ones who took the gospel like wildfire and spread it throughout all of Europe. Sometimes we think it's the old preacher man. Last night I had an experience that I didn't plan on doing. But I came up here to be alone for a little while in the evening. And then um, this person was having a birthday, and they came and fetched me to go to the birthday party. So I thought, well, all right, I'll go. And they just took me back here to this neighborhood just, just behind us back here. You all know what I'm talking about? I have no idea what it is. But there are hundreds of homes. And the first thing that hit me is I have got to go house to house, house to house, to talk to these people and say, you all know about Church by the Sea? And they'll all go, oh yeah, we see the cross up there. It's lit up there. We see it every night. It's great. Have you all ever thought about coming here? Oh no, we have no idea who they are. They say that all the time. Why, we've come by here 50, 11 times and we've never known who this church is. Well, guess what? Uncle Dave and his old knees can't do that. Who's going to have to go back there into that neighborhood and help me? Are you with me? Come on now. I'm, now that's called putting the pressure on you, okay? That's called sweating them out, okay? Now come on, I'm playing with, no, I'm serious. It's going to take a, a group of us to go out there and to evangelize and to share with Madeira Beach, just like Father Ralph did in 1946 when he uh, had the idea of, of forming this congregation. All right, very good. Now then, something else I have to tell you on this missionary journey. Any time in the Bible, that you see a woman's name, you better pay attention. A woman's name is not necessarily just general. But when you see it, it's very specifically put right there for a very specific reason. So, let's read chapter uh, Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 14. On that missionary journey with Paul, a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a God-fearer, was listening intently to Paul, 
And the Lord opened up her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Paul was sharing from the scripture that Jesus was the Christ. Paul was telling the story of Jesus Christ. He gave his own personal testimony and then he invited everyone to receive Christ. That was Paul's method. And when Lydia and her household had been baptized, evidently they had received the gospel, they received the word of God, they followed up in baptism, Lydia urged the missionary team saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon them. You know what that word prevailed means? You ever, how about your mama? How about your mama? You, ever, you know that look she used to give you? Remember what mama used to say? Don't you make me come out there and get you. You all remember that? That's what Lydia was saying. Now listen up. If I'm a saved woman of God and I am valuable and important, then let me have a ministry too. And she invited the three missionaries. Along with us was Paul and was Silas and Timothy. Lydia was a businesswoman manufacturing high-end goods. She made a purple dye that could only be used uh, among the royalty. No commoner was allowed to purchase it. So she made a good living. She opens up her home for ministry and she financially funds the mission trip that we're on. And the word of God was joyfully being received and many Jews and Greeks, many of the new believers were prominent women in society. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think witnessed and brought those women to Christ? other prominent women. Y'all with me? I'll tell you, I can go, I sat last night with a bunch of young people last night and I couldn't even talk to them. I'm so old and, and I'm so old school, if you will. All I could do is just sit there and listen to them. And I was just amazed at what they were doing. Listen, every person has uh, an ability based on your generation or your age or your sphere of influence that you can reach for Christ that I can't. You're with me? So it's very, very important, especially you young folks. You have to know you have a powerful part in all of this. Now then, well, you still ready to go on some more trips? We doing all right so far? Did you have to change your underwear yet? Okay, keep it packed away. Here we go. Acts 17, verse 4. In Macedonia, that's Greece, Paul continued to reason and to persuade a large number of Greek fearing, uh, God fearing Greeks and a large number of leading women to Christ. Women in Asia Minor and Greece, they held high positions in uh, social life, uh, in business, in politics, and in religion. And many of these prominent leading women, they owned their own businesses were elected to public office and were highly influential. <clears throat> Acts 18, verse 1. Paul has now decided that we should go into Athens. And Paul goes to Athens and he spends some time there and he shares the gospel and everybody likes it up and until they hear about Jesus being raised from the dead. And when they heard that, they scoffed at Paul. And Paul said, all right, you count yourselves so intellectual, so smart, I'll go to another city. So we leave Athens, and Paul now decides that he will take us to Corinth. Verse 2 of chapter 18. And Paul found a Jewish husband and wife named Aquila and Priscilla. The reason is because Claudius, the Roman Empire, had expelled all the Jews from Rome. So Aquila and Priscilla, they have decided, I don't know why, but they decided then we'll go down to southern Greece, we'll go down to Corinth. Now let me say something about Corinth. 
If I said Sodom and Gomorrah to you, well, okay, last night was Saturday night. Hey, gang, come with me. Let's go to Sodom and Gomorrah. What are you going to do at Sodom and Gomorrah on Saturday night? Are you with me? Does that give you a bad taste in your mouth? The worst thing you could call somebody during Paul's day was a Corinthian. The people in Corinth made Sodom and Gomorrah look like a trip to Disneyland. Filthiest, most immoral, idolatrous people never existed. I don't know, maybe that's why Aquila and Priscilla went there. So Paul finds Aquila and Priscilla, and because Paul had the same trade that they did, they decide that they will join themselves together working as tent makers. Now that's interesting. That's all we know. Aquila and Priscilla leave Rome. Paul, he comes from um, Israel and makes his way over into northern Greece, comes down, and they find themselves, not by accident, God puts them together in Corinth. Now then, Aquila and Priscilla, they were already believers in Jesus Christ when Paul met them. We don't think about that, do we? Yes, you remember how on the day of Pentecost, the day the church was born, it says specifically that Jewish people from Rome had traveled to Jerusalem for that great and wonderful feast of Pentecost. And there, Peter stood up and gave the great message, repent, and be baptized, each and every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is not only for you, but it's also for your children and for many who are far off. Now, I don't know if Aquila and Priscilla actually came to Pentecost that day, or that they and or someone came, heard the message, received the message, took that word back to Rome, and there evangelized the Roman area before Paul ever set foot in Italy. Now I'm trying to get you to hear something. Who takes the word and distributes it in every direction? We do, right? That's our job. Well, we want to. It's a great and wonderful privilege. All right, very good. That's how the word of God spread throughout Italy. Now then, Paul lived with Aquila and Priscilla for two years in Corinth. They became great friends, and they formed a ministry partnership as tent makers. They made portable tents out of leather and goat hair. That means there was a lot of time to sit around and what? As they're spinning, right? All right, to talk and to visit and to get to know one another. Today, we use the term tent maker as a business person who goes overseas and actually funds their own ministry. They do their business while they're out, and then in their off times, they share the gospel. That's a tent maker. Now, this partnership between Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla was so successful that Paul, for the first time, could quit working and spend his full time sharing the gospel, and teaching those who were saved. Please note here, we think of missionaries as spreading the gospel to large groups of people. Oh, absolutely. I have been in the arena where we have had thousands upon thousands, and, and the word of God is spread in their own language, and we see, I, I can't give you a number, but we receive literally thousands of people at a time to come down and to receive Christ as Savior. And we think of missionaries as doing things like that, right? But missionaries also do something else. They find quality leaders, and they pour themselves into these quality leaders, and such is what Paul did with Aquila and Priscilla. Now then, can you imagine what it would be like for two years, sitting side by side, sewing with Paul, listening, learning, and asking questions? Young couples would come, individuals would come, large groups would come. And I believe it was at this time that Priscilla, specifically Priscilla, she mastered Paul's method and technique of sharing the gospel. 
It's that simple. It's that easy. I say John 3.16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Okay, you got that? And I break it down real easy. And I say, God loves everyone. Christ paid for our sins. By faith we are saved. That's the gospel. You got it? Priscilla, she mastered this technique. This technique of going deep into the scriptures and explaining it to anyone. And then witnessing and telling about Jesus' life. Giving her own testimony. And then inviting others to Christ. Yes. All right. Are you ready to keep going? Are you getting tired yet? Now don't push me. We can stop and, you know, we can have a donut or two. If Anybody want a coffee? I do. Okay, so let's have a coffee. All right, then we'll go on. All right. Now, Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla, they established a church in Corinth. And once the church is established, he says, well, it's time to go on. Oh, no, Paul. Now, you were there with him for two years. No, no, don't, don't leave us. Don't say, no, I'm sorry. I have to do what God calls me to do. We're going to have to trust that the Holy Spirit will bring that next person who is able to, uh, to build on that foundation that Paul laid. So it's very, very important. So here we go. After establishing the church, Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla leave Corinth, and they decide that they will go to Ephesus. And Scripture says, the road to Ephesus was filled with danger. Paul will later write uh, to the church in Rome, and he will say, pay attention. Now pay very close attention, because this one word that I'm about ready to use is going to be paramount now. I'm tricky old Dave, so stay with me. You ready? Here comes the word. Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles do. This woman, Priscilla, is placed before her husband, Aquila, and that was not done by accident. Remember what I told you when you see a woman's name? All right. Priscilla now takes the lead in the ministry while Aquila runs the family business. When the missionary team arrives in Ephesus, Paul decides that it's time for him to leave. And he believes that Priscilla and Aquila are to be left there and to start a house church. No different than Father Ralph when he started this church. He drug those people down to that union hall that that Saturday night before had beer bottles all around it and nasty as it were. And Sunday morning, I forget who it is, I, I need to remember paid some young scamp to go in there and quick clean it up, clean it up, so that they could bring a few people into that building. And then from that, look where it led to today. Is that not amazing? That's why we always want to remember our history and our heritage from those days. All right, very good. Now, Paul, he goes back because he wants to go to, back to Antioch, to the sending church that sent them out, commissioned them to report all that the Lord was doing through these new believers. The believers are going any and everywhere and they're sharing the gospel and all of Europe is being saved because of these people. That was his message. Now, Priscilla and Aquila start a house church. And as they do, now watch, we're going to switch just a minute. A new character is coming into play. Very valuable, very precious, very honorable and important to know this man. Now a Jew by the name of Apollos, he was from Alexandria, Egypt. He was an eloquent man. Oh my goodness. He came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the Old Testament scriptures. He was a master teacher. And Apollos had been instructed only with the baptism of John. He had not heard about Jesus as of yet. Now, Apollos was fervently speaking out and teaching accurately the things concerning the coming of the Messiah. Apollos knew the Old Testament. He knew of the promise of the long-awaited Messiah. And Apollos' message was, Make yourselves ready. Repent, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Make yourselves ready for the coming of the Messiah. 
Now, Apollos, he spoke out boldly with this message in the Jewish synagogue when Priscilla and her husband Aquila heard him. Priscilla took Apollos aside and she accurately explained the gospel. You know the Old Testament? Christ has come, I'm here to tell you. He has come. Oh no, I missed him. Yes, you missed him. Just like you and I. We missed him, didn't we? We were people, unfortunately, born too late, weren't we, to see Jesus at that time. So he laments over that just a little bit. And then Priscilla walks Apollos through the Bible, reasoning and proving that Jesus is the Christ, and Apollos receives Jesus as his Savior. Now some time goes by, we have absolutely no idea what it is, and Apollos, he decided, I need to go to Corinth. Where y'all left, that little church that's back there. And the brethren in Ephesus, they encouraged him. And Priscilla and Aquila wrote a letter to the disciples in Corinth to welcome this Apollos. And when Apollos arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed. And Apollos powerfully demonstrated by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ, the way Paul did the way Priscilla did, the way Apollos did, the way the New Testament believers did. And Apollos will become the lead pastor of that congregation. God knew exactly who he needed for that church. He needed a man like Paul. He needed a husband and wife team like uh, Aquila and Priscilla to start a church in Corinth. They were missionaries, that's what they do. They're church planters and they go from one city to the next, and then comes somebody else to not, if you will, lead more to Christ, if you will, but to mature them in Christ. And Paul will say about Apollos later, he'll say, I planted, but Apollos watered, but it was God who gave the increase. Well, let's see if we can get some wisdom from our missionary story today. The most important thing you can do is study the scriptures for your own personal growth. I mean it. Each day, there shouldn't be a day go by without an opportunity for you to get into the Word. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That Word that I read, that New American Standard Version, I like it because it's more to the Greek or the Hebrew. But did you know what got me saved? It wasn't that hard Greek Hebrew that I now learn from. I got it from a paraphrase of the New Testament called Good News for Modern Man. You know why? Because when I was 16 years old, I probably read on about a third grade level. But boy, I could understand it. And all I read and I remember is that Jesus loved me. You're kidding. No, I I love Bill or Jack, but I don't know about Dave. Well, and I read that, and it was almost, I read it in my own language. I read it in my own ignorant language. Boy, and it made something to me. And then I was born again as well. Second, we need to know the scriptures in order to lead others to Christ. We have already given you a gospel, John 3, 16. Everybody knows that. You know Romans 10, 9. If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised Christ from the dead, we shall be saved. You know Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are we saved through faith. You all know those verses. God has those verses. You don't need to know the entire Bible, but you need to know key verses. The Scripture is the living Word of God. And I love the Scriptures, because when I get into the Scriptures, it isn't necessarily, I know that He's not writing to me. He was writing to those folks back there in their day. So He's writing to them for me. And now as I read that scripture, I go, oh, Lord, show me how to apply that to my life. That's how I'm going to grow. That's how I'm going to change. Yes, and in the Word of God, you will find strength and wisdom to face each and every day and knowledge to lead someone else to Christ. And that's the missionary journey you've just been on. How'd it feel? 
a little tired? <laughs> yeah, but boy, but now you're motivated. Well, so it wasn't old preacher Dave. I didn't have to go a thousand years to some kind of Bible school and try to get some fancy degree and learn something. I'm going to tell you, in this church, right now, you have two fabulous opportunities. Just like Paul shares the gospel, shares the scripture, tells about Jesus, talks about his testimony, offers an invitation. You got Hank Johnson this morning that's going to teach a Sunday school class, and he's teaching on Luke. He's teaching in the Gospels, and that's going to be held in three minutes from now. True or false? Say false. Okay. It'll be, thank you very much. It'll be five minutes. Get back there in that Bible study. Boy, learn something. Enjoy something. And then on Friday morning, Hank teaches another Bible study. Go figure in 2 Corinthians. Now, why is Hank doing that? He's so selfish. That's why he's doing it. Hank's own testimony is, Dave, I learned more by teaching than I do anywhere else. So I decided I'd teach so I could learn. Yeah, isn't that a great attitude? Avail yourself to the Word of God, whether you find a TV preacher, let's say, that's a good teacher, or someone on the radio that's a good teacher. Plug in, listen to, and grow and learn. But that will never take the place of reading the Bible for yourself. Amen and amen. All right, get the old preacher to be quiet so we can stand up and we can sing. And that song we're going to sing is, I love to tell the story, so stand up and let's sing it. What do you say?
tell you how sweet that is. Now then, you have the words of wisdom. Go out and live out that story and then share when you have the opportunity. Would you receive the benediction of the Lord? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and give you his peace. Depart now in the Lord from the Lord's house with God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. Depart in peace. Amen. Go in peace.